Hello everyone and welcome to this, the first of um, two virtual alumni lectures for um, 2022. Uh, my name is Carl Watkins, I'm Deputy Chair of the History Faculty and I'm a historian of the Middle Ages. Before I introduce our speaker uh, this evening, I just want to underscore a few of the items of housekeeping that you can see before you on the, uh, on the slide. Um, your cameras and your microphones are going to remain off during the course of the webinar but there will be a chance for you to uh, raise questions that you might have uh, during uh, the course of the lecture. So please type these in using the question and answer function um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll then uh, ventriloquize these questions um, at the end of the lecture. I'll raise them for you um, with our speaker, Nora Berend. I should say that we're going to record the lecture, but we won't be recording um, the question and, and answer session um, at the end. So I'm delighted to introduce my, my colleague, um, Nora Berend. Um, Nora is a professor of European history and she is a key member of the community of medievalists um, here in Cambridge. She has very wide intellectual interests indeed. Um, these were rooted originally in the medieval history of Eastern Europe. They now extend over a much broader geographical area and also well beyond the Middle Ages too. Nora's work has tackled uh, themes such as the, the place of non-Christians in Christian society, processes of Christianization, frontiers, sanctity, violence, and processes of state making. More recently, she's concentrated on questions of identity formation in the medieval and modern periods and the connections that run between the two. She speaks to us today uh, with some illustrative slides um, on the subject of migrations, real and imagined, in the medieval world. So thank you very much, Nora, and over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to share the screen. I hope you can see it. Um, and thank you for coming along this evening. Today, many people treat migration as both a negative force in society and as an extraordinary occurrence to be designated as a crisis and to be prevented by any means. There is also a long and erroneous tradition of seeing the medieval period as one of static immobility only broken by violent invasions. In contrast, in the Middle Ages, migration was seen as a natural part of human life even as something to be valued. Much in medieval culture led to valorizing migration. Life was conceptualized as an ephemeral journey where one's attention should be focused on the ultimate goal, the attainment of salvation, rather than on the acquisition of perishable goods. This is exemplified in the late 15th century morality play, Everyman, where the main character who symbolizes every human being is told to prepare for death and especially for the final reckoning which will determine the fate of his soul, whether he goes to heaven or hell. To his despair, he then discovers that none of his earthly possessions or friends are of any help, but only contrition, repentance, and his good deeds. And his good deeds initially are so weak that they cannot get up off the ground. So he has to find a way to strengthen the, the good deeds that can then accompany him. The play depicts every man's journey to death represented much like a pilgrimage. And this is an early printed uh, version of the every man play. And you can of course see this uh, human being and death debating at the grave. Thus life itself was a migration towards the final otherworldly destination, and it had to be used well, not to gather earthly riches, power, or other perishable goods, but to live a pious life and accumulate good deeds. Early monasticism specifically fostered the imagery of pilgrimage for earthly life as a whole, emphasizing its transitory nature. This migration towards the heavenly homeland, therefore, invested migration itself with a sacral aura. 
the salvific aspect of migration, um, of, of, therefore of physical movement, was also given a new form, a smaller scale exercise that was seen to bring spiritual benefits. This was pilgrimage to holy places, a penitential and spiritual exercise that came to characterize medieval Christianity. People visited shrines in the hope of a cure and also to do penance for sins they committed. And on the slide, you see a representation of St. James himself, uh, who was one of the apostles, but also became um, uh, one of the most important pilgrimage sites, Santiago Compostela in Spain, uh, was supposed to be his grave, his shrine. Um, so he himself is represented as a pilgrim carrying the sign, the shell, um, which became, of course, even until today, the sign of the pilgrims to Santiago. Some of these pilgrims went on long journeys to holy places of heightened significance, such as Jerusalem. One famous medieval woman who became addicted to going on pilgrimages, of course, you might have heard of her, is Marjorie Kemp uh, from nearby Kings Lynn, late 14th, early 15th century laywoman. Um, apart from accomplishing numerous pilgrimages within England, she went to the Holy Land, to Rome, and to Santiago in Spain. When she went to the holy places, she visualized Christ's suffering and had fits of weeping. While many people went on real pilgrimages, pilgrimage itself could be imagined as well. That is, people unable to travel to faraway places read the narratives of such pilgrimages and participated in them in spirit, meditating on these texts. And of course, now with COVID, we can all empathize with this kind of approach. From the end of the 11th century, a new form of pilgrimage became a great success with Europe's warrior elites. This was armed pilgrimage known to us as the Crusades towards the so-called Holy Land, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. The aim of these crusaders was to take these lands back from the infidel. And on the PowerPoint, um, you see an especially chilling representation. It is, of course, a representation in apocalyptic form, uh, but you can see Christ himself leading the crusaders. Um, and this, of course, projects very clearly the divine approval for this holy war. These armed pilgrims could travel to fight in the Holy Land and then return to their homes, but they could also end up settling in the conquered areas. There was therefore no clear conceptual division between, between pilgrimage as a temporary journey with a return to one's home on the one hand and pilgrimage as migration in the modern sense of the word on the other hand. There were more reasons to valorize migration in the medieval period. The migration of peoples from east to west was understood until around 1500 as a basic foundation story of Europe. These are the so-called origogentist stories. The basic framework they follow is the biblical story of the Israelites. Medieval authors created a link between migration and the formation of a people from barbarism to civilization. So the faraway homeland was inhabited originally by barbarians. And as they started to migrate, they were humanized, if you like, civilized and organized politically. And finally, of course, they were Christianized. Just as in the biblical story, migration supposedly shaped the various peoples of Europe including, for example, the Goths in the stories of Isidore of Seville, the Britons, descendant allegedly of Brutus from Troy in the Historia Britonum, or the Franks. The Trojan origin story of the Franks was particularly successful. So several medieval communities vied for these origins, trying to find some hero or at least a lesser figure in the Aeneid who could be seen as their ancestor. Some, however, opted to 
finding an alternative, differently prestigious ancestor. These stories were erudite and constructed based on ideas from classical antiquity and the Bible, rather than being records of real migrations. In addition, there was one more reason for migration to be valorized. And this was the life stories of a lot of the authors themselves. The intellectual elite who consisted of ecclesiastics for most of the medieval period. So exactly those people who authored the vast majority of the medieval written sources often moved to study at university abroad and then perhaps to take up ecclesiastical careers abroad as well. Personal stories therefore contributed to the positive views about mobility. So there was a, a positive conceptualization of the movement of people in the medieval period. But this um, positive uh, conceptualization only partially overlaps with modern definitions of migration. The latter usually consists of the movement of people from one geographic area to another across political boundaries and for the purpose of settlement. In modern politicized usage, migration um, carries a negative charge, of course, and we are surrounded by that these days. Medieval conceptualizations, however, included a positive spiritual or moral dimension, either connected to individual salvation or to the formation of peoples. Moreover, there was no sharp division between certain types of journeys, such as pilgrimage to a holy site, and movement for the purpose of permanent settlement somewhere else. So medieval views differed from uh, ours to, to that extent. If we compare medieval ideas about migration with real medieval migration in the sense of groups of actual people and individuals who moved sometimes even long distances in order to settle somewhere else, we find that the positive conceptual framework often clashed with real migrant experience. The attitudes towards real migrants could vary significantly. Locals could be welcoming or hostile, and migrant experiences covered a wide range of possibilities. Those who today would be called economic migrants were the most favorably thought of and received by the elites. Indeed, they were often offered advantageous terms in order to persuade them to migrate. This migration included moving across political borders, but not only and not necessarily, because local populations from within the same political realm could be attracted to towns, for example. Those offering these privileges were kings and lords in order to attract settlers to their lands or towns, or to attract people with, who possess specific skills. The new settlers, were important in order to generate revenues for these rulers or other lords, since lands themselves were worthless if you did not have the population to work the land or use it in some way. So settlers were valuable assets to do agricultural work, populate towns, bring in revenues through trade, or provide skilled labor, for example, for mining. An early example of the granting of privileges in order to attract settlers to a town is the Charter of Loris, granted by King Louis VII in 1155 and then widely imitated in northern France. This charter included the setting of a specific amount of tax per house, so if you migrated into the town and settled there, you did not have to pay more exemption from tolls and all kinds of other taxes, and exemption from military duty far outside the town. The stipulation was that burghers only had to go 
to a distance from which they could easily return the same day. So this was basically defensive warfare and they could not be forced to go far away. The king also guaranteed that burghers could freely sell their houses if they wanted to and granted the right to live in Loris to those who stayed there for a year and a day without anyone advancing a claim over them. Not only was there migration from rural to urban areas within the same kingdom, many people moved to a different country attracted by new opportunities. For example, rural and urban immigrants in 12th and 13th century Central European villages and towns gained a better legal status with more economic and legal freedoms for those arriving to cultivate lands or to settle in these towns than what they had enjoyed at home uh, and also compared to the local populations of the places where they migrated to. As a result, local populations then aspired to gain the same privileges. Yet such a context also easily gave rise to hostility. And in the later medieval period, local revolts even led to the massacre of foreign born settlers. While there were Romance speaking and other immigrants as well, the most significant minority in these Central European regions were German speakers. They were not, however, from one particular area and indeed German included people who for us, of course, would not count as such. Flemish speakers were a significant group who in the sources show up often as Teutonici, Germans. A little song that is supposedly medieval in origin, but was conserved much, much later, expresses the reasons for going East, that is to Bohemia, Hungary, and Poland. We want to ride to Eastland, to Eastland we want to go. All over the green heaths, freshly, there is a better place to, to go. Czech, Hungarian, and Polish rulers were particularly generous and wanted to attract these immigrants. In the middle of the 13th century, Duke Boleslav of Poland gave a charter to Krakow that stipulated that no Poles living in the countryside can be made burghers of the city, effectively pres a prescription for immigration. So if the locals cannot go to the town, somebody from outside has to come in. Many rulers were accused of giving more favorable areas of settlements to immigrants than they granted to locals. The newcomers played a variety of roles. One mid 13th century Hungarian charter stated that those who arrived from Teutonia cultivated the deserted wasteland and sent one armed warrior for every six households to the army. All three countries relied on German miners to extract salt, silver, and gold. The rights of these settlers came to be called Jus Teutonicum, German law. But in fact, the precise content of the law varied from place to place. The only thing that was constant was that it was better than what in the local inhabitants enjoyed. So it was a privileged status. The presence of immigrant settlers led to two opposing types of reactions. On the one hand, local populations strove for a similar status. They tried to obtain the same privileges. On the other hand, hostility was brewing, which sometimes led to riots. By the late 13th century in Poland, ecclesiastics became bitter enemies of German settlers, fomenting hatred because the Germans were not paying the Peter's Pence tax paid by the Poles. So the eccle ecclesiastics were aggrieved that uh, they, they were not getting this tax from uh, the Germans. They complained of being denied their rights and even claimed adversities have become manifold in the country through the entry of his people for because of them, the German immigrants, the entire Polish population are besieged, disdained, shaken by wars, deprived of the venerable rights and customs of the fatherland. It is no surprise then that language became a key issue in late medieval conflicts in Poland. 
there were opportunities for and hostility to migrants at the other end of Europe too. In late medieval England, um, we can find immigrants from continental Europe, from the Low Countries, France, German lands, and so on. And there is now a fantastic database, the outcome of a collective project that collected over 64,000 names of individuals known to have migrated to England between uh, 1330 and 1550. And uh, there is the, the website. So if you want, you can um, try it and, and sort of search it. It includes, for example, places of origin in Venice, Genoa, Cologne, Rouen, many other places, and occupations ranging from servants, merchants, tailors, to weavers, shoemakers, and so on. Indeed, beer brewing was imported into England from the Low Countries, as recent work has demonstrated. And I'm cheating a little bit because the image is actually from a German uh, manuscript, and it's a German uh, beer brewer and not one of these immigrants to England, but I could not find an image of that. English brewers had been making ale for centuries, which was very weak in alcohol content and were, was brewed using malt, yeast, and boiled water by most households, particularly by women, for their own domestic production because, the main, uh, because this was the main drink of people. Water was polluted and, and unsafe to drink. Ale was also sold for profit. Beer, however, started to be imported from the continent and the Hanseatic towns, uh, the big uh, Northern European trade network uh, was key in this from the middle of the 14th century. Beer had a different taste containing hops and it could be conserved for much longer than ale. After importing the product, then Dutch settlers, immigrants came to England and started to brew beer. Being an immigrant in England in the late medieval period, also meant subjection to increasing rules. The whole naturalization process was invented then. And in the 15th century, in the context of war, uh, often uh, oaths of fealty were demanded from immigrants and a direct poll tax was imposed on unnaturalized aliens. And finally, while the war was going on, foreign beer brewers were even accused of trying to poison people with their beer and their breweries in London were attacked. I would now like to turn to an area where I have uh, done a lot of work, medieval Hungary, um, and look at uh, different cases to show you how both real and invented migration played a role in the Middle Ages. The tale of origin of the Hungarians played a major role in medieval chronicles in the kingdom. These chronicles claimed to record the early history of the Hungarians as one of a long migration. These narratives were written centuries later than the purported events. The Hungarian Anonymous, a chronicler writing in the early 13th century, claimed to set down an accurate account uh, for the knowledge of future generations. He addressed an unnamed friend, um, the friend also being either real or imaginary, we don't know, uh, in the prologue, at whose request he set down the history of the people of Hungary, lest it be lost to posterity forever. It would be most unworthy and completely unfitting for the most noble people of Hungary to hear as if in sleep of the beginnings of their kind and of their bravery and deeds from the false stories of peasants and the gabbling song of minstrels. May they not more nobly perceive the truth of the matters from the sure explanation of scripture and the straightforward exposition of historical accounts. Hungary should rejoice in the gift of her men of letters because she has now a record of the beginning of her line of kings and noblemen for which kings shall be praised and honor to the King Eternal and the Holy Mary his mother, through whose grace the kings of Hungary and noblemen have the kingdom for happy purpose here and ever after. You can see that it's combining prayer, in a sense, with um, talking about the origins of the Hungarian kings. The anonymous author dismisses alternative explanations and positions about the origin of the Hungarians, 
and um, uh, tries to show the biblical uh, origin and fit the Hungarians into the biblical scheme. So Magog, the son of Japheth, is the ancestor of the Hungarians, according to him, deriving the ethnonym Moger, Magyar for the Hungarians from the name of this king. Attila the Hun was born from Magog's lineage. He left Scythia and occupied Pannonia after putting the Romans to flight. The Hungarians descended from the line of Attila, but were still living in Scythia. As Scythia could no longer sustain a growing population, the Hungarians decided to find new lands for themselves and their choice fell on Pannonia. They learned from rumor that this had been the land of Attila. So they went there through a long migration via Suzdal and Kiev, finally arriving in Pannonia. And a 14th century illuminated chronicle um, illustrated the land taking of the Hungarians. So you can see uh, these big groups arriving into the new country. The migration story itself is redolent of biblical imagery. The Hungarians move through a completely deserted region for a while. They rest for 40 days after the first victorious uh, battle, and they're very explicitly compared to the Israelites. Well, did God fulfill in Prince Almos and his son Arpad the prophecy that Moses uttered to the sons of Israel, saying, every place that your foot shall tread upon shall be yours. For the places whereupon Prince Almos and his son Arpad, together with their noblemen trod, their descendants had and have from that day to the present. The author borrowed a lot from earlier Western authors. When the Hungarians appeared in Western Europe in the late ninth century, they were unknown, but Western clerical authors had to fit them into the knowledge that they already had. And so they very quickly identified the Hungarians with the Scythians, classical antiquities, super barbarians. Um, of course, um, they came from a similar direction and they were also seen as barbarians and they were warriors. So there were superficial similarities uh, which warranted this. Um, but once the, um, this identification was made, it entailed various other things. So the Scythians, of course, according to these classical authors, descended from Magog, the son of Japheth. Um, and also um, the Huns were already identified as um, uh, a people who had lived in Scythia. Um, so this package from the Western authors uh, was borrowed. Um, and if you have the Hungarians starting out from Scythia and arriving in what is now Hungary, the only way that you, you could get them there is via these long migrations. And so here is this kind of invented migration on a map. Other Hungarian chronicles, repeated versions of this migration story but they changed various details. Um, they gave uh, the, the Hungarians um, a, a different um, ancestry from uh, Magor, an eponymous ancestor. Um, they debated the location of, of Scythia um, and uh, so on. Obviously, um, just as the other migration stories, the Origogendi stories, uh, this invented migration of the Hungarians uh, was seen as defining Hungarian identity. And it indeed became foundational for Hungarian identity. It is still dear to nationalists today. But it was um, not um, simply the uh, migration of the whole people, uh, which was interesting for Hungarians. But histories of many individual families were also linked to tales of migration. Two main narratives in the late 13th century and in the 14th century include lists of immigrant nobles. These accounts enumerate 19 cases of immigrant families of knights. Their origins are German, French, Italian, Bohemian, Moravian, and Iberian. I want to focus on two of these stories that are the most interesting in terms of migration. We also need to consider the background for creating this list, uh, which is that um, in the early 13th century, the nobility started to gain the upper hand compared to royal power 
and they were preventing newly arrived aristocrats from taking positions at the royal court. So being an old immigrant became very important. So these two families, Wolfgar and Hedrich, who were brothers, supposedly immigrated to Hungary during the reign of Duke Geza, that is in the second half of the 10th century. The 13th century chronicle, however, also noted that Wolfgar founded a monastery. And this monastic foundation is a historical fact but it didn't happen in the late 10th century, but rather in the middle of the 12th century. The Charter of Foundation is dated to 1157. So in fact, we have charter evidence that demonstrates that the brothers immigrated to Hungary during the reign of King Geza II in the middle of the 12th century. In order to depict their lineage as more illustrious, however, their descendants represented them as coming in in these early days when Hungary was Christianized. So the idea was that uh, King Giza in the 10th century called in immigrants to help convert the Hungarians. Another case is perhaps even more interesting because quite possibly a family claimed an immigrant ancestry when in fact they had none. According to the 13th century chronicle, Pot of Lebin was a German immigrant who played a role as messenger between the King of Hungary and the German emperor in the 11th century. Conrad of Altenburg is named as his descendant who actually lived in the period when the Chronicle was written in the late 13th century. However, we again have historical information about Pot. He was actually Palatine of Hungary, so very high ranking nobleman in the early 13th century and he founded this monastery of Leibing then. It's impossible that Conrad of Altenburg confused somebody who was his grandfather or even perhaps his own father with a distant ancestor who immigrated in the 11th century. I suggest that this was a conscious strategy to actually project uh, into the past this immigrant ancestor. The reason for that was that Conrad made an alliance against the King of Hungary um, and therefore for a while, he was punished for this disloyalty. His lands were confiscated, including the monastery of Lebi. Finally, he was pardoned and his possessions were restored to him. But in the aftermath of this, he probably started to exaggerate the ancient lineage, uh, linking it to this invented immigrant ancestor. Um, so we can see that it could actually be advantageous to present oneself as the descendant of immigrants. These tales of migrations were of course created by the families themselves to enhance the prestige of uh, their own uh, lineage. In these tales, therefore, we can already trace two opposing views about immigrants, a positive one explicitly expressed and a negative one tarnishing the standing of recent immigrants which served as the backdrop and impetus to the novel insistence in the 13th century on the equality of old immigrant noble families to the original immigrant Hungarians. The same tension between positive and negative ideas attached to migrants can also be found in tales of mass immigration into the Kingdom of Hungary, but the balance between them was shifting towards more explicit expressions of hostility Several uh, medieval texts address such mass immigration into Hungary. The well-known early 11th century King's Mirror, a text aimed at teaching the heir to the throne about good rulership attributed to King Stephen I, the first Christian King of Hungary, but written by a cleric, extolled the usefulness of immigrants. For as the guests arrive from different parts and provinces, so they bring with them different tongues and customs, different examples and weapons, and all this adorns the royal court while deterring foreigners from overweening contempt. For a country of one single language and one set of customs is weak and vulnerable. Therefore, I enjoin on you, my son, to protect newcomers benevolently and to hold them in high esteem so that they should stay with you rather than dwell elsewhere. The presence of immigrants at the royal court was indeed a commonplace occurrence in the period. Stephen's new kingdom was heavily shaped by immigrant clerics and nobles. 
the continued arrival of immigrants in Hungary is summed up by the 14th century illuminated chronicle, which lists Bohemians, Poles, Greeks, Spaniards, Ishmaelites or Saracens, Pechenegs, Armenians, Saxons, Thuringians, those from Mycenae and the Rhine, Cumans and Latins among the immigrant settlers in the Kingdom of Hungary who stayed and intermarried with the Hungarians, gaining the right to live in the realm, and some of them even being incorporated into the nobility. The Kumans appear in this list. We also have a much more detailed account of their arrival, which however also shows the limits of the positive medieval attitude to migration. The mid 13th century master Rogerius, who chronicled the Mongol invasion of Hungary, recounts how Kuten, king of the Kumans, sent an embassy to the king of Hungary, asking permission to move into the realm with his followers after he had been defeated by the Mongols. His lands had been ravaged and his subjects killed. The Hungarian king was pleased to accept the subjection of another ruler, happy also to have the military aid of the Kuman, and welcomed the possibility of converting them to Christianity because the Kuman leaders promised to accept baptism. So the Kumans traveled to Hungary. King Bela went to meet them at the border of his country and granted him and his people such exceptional honors as the inhabitants of the land had neither done nor seen since times beyond memory, says the, uh, the master Rogerius. The Kuman presence, however, led to conflict. Enmity grew between uh, the Hungarians and the Kumans. Significantly, Master Rogerius describes the confrontation using ethnic labels. The Kumans were accused of roaming around Hungary, destroying crops and raping women. Hungarian nobles were res resentful of the royal favor that the Kumans received. The king was keen on uh, Kuman support, however, especially as the Mongols were nearing Hungary. But as the Mongols attacked, the Kumans were accused of having been a Mongol vanguard and the Kuman leader Kuten was murdered by a mob. All the people clamored against him. He has to die, he has to die. In the end, he and his entourage were captured and their heads immediately cut off and thrown out of the windows of the palace into the crowd, records the chronicler. The specific cause of the Kuman's behavior is attributed by the author to their nature. Uh, they were tough, wild, and not used to subordination. Indeed, Rogerius actually thought that the king had a duty to honor his guests, so evoking very much uh, the text of, of King Stephen, and then that the Hungarians should not have been resentful of that. Um, he also, the king also took an oath to protect the Kumans and was their only protector. Um, but nonetheless, Rogerius suggests that the charges against the Kumans in terms of their destructive behavior were true and implicitly they're held responsible as new immigrants whose customs are different. Tales of migration about foreign groups differed from both tales around the Hungarians migration and those around noble families ancestors. There was less attention paid to where they came from only the motivation for migration was emphasized. And as I said, Rogerius really tried to take balanced view. He did not simply blame uh, the Kumans. He tried to evaluate the reasons of hostility, but nonetheless, the different nature of these uh, Kumans plays a significant role in the account. The treatment of real immigrants was intertwined with the tales in the case of individual and mass immigration into the kingdom. Whether immigrant nobles were accepted in society or how the Kumans were treated was no longer a mere literary construction, but impacted on the life of actual people. Long-term processes, however, were more complicated. The Kumans themselves were um, they, they left after the murder of their chieftain, but they were invited back after the Mongol invasion and settled in Hungary. Indeed, one of the rulers uh, was called Vladislas the Kuman because he uh, was the issue of a marriage between the king's son and a, a, the daughter of a Kuman leader. And this uh, illumination shows his ultimate fate. Uh, he was murdered finally by the Kumans 
we find persistence of migration stories in medieval Hungarian narratives. Learned authors wrote and rewrote the tales of the migration of the Hungarian people, also constructing polemics against each other on various points. Their sources were authorities such as the Bible and classical authors, often ultimately predating the very existence of the Hungarians. Migration for these authors was a positive aspect of the history of both peoples and individuals. There was an aura of chosenness, of being a new Israel associated to migration modeled on the Bible. Situ situating one's own noble family as migrants, drawing a parallel to the original Hungarian immigrants, as well as finding prestige or security in situating the immigration at a particular point in time, the foundation of the Christian kingdom of Hungary, became intertwined with the tale of migration of the Hungarians. There was a positive discourse about migration itself, yet we can see the emergence of a distinction. Individual immigrants or certain groups of immigrants were criticized and even demonized. And although this was not tied explicitly to them being immigrants as such, but rather to being nomads, barbarians, or newcomers who wanted to take political power. The distinction between old migrants, which was positive, and new migrants, which was negative, is latent in the case of the Kumans and explicit in the case of the immigrant nobles. It did not affect the medieval discourse on migration itself, which continued to carry a positive value. On the medieval foundations, tales of migration persist into modern times, but they also gain a clearer distinction. Old migration is more and more valorized, whereas new migration increasingly demonized. This is particularly striking in the case of the Kumans. The Kumans who settled in Hungary assimilated over the centuries. They intermarried, they became Christians, they uh, adopted the Hungarian language and became indistinguishable and indeed intermixed. However, their own specific identity was in inverse relationship with their assimilation. By the time they were to all practical purposes indistinguishable from the locals, um, they actually um, attached their identity to a territory called Kumania within Hungary. And so even today, the inhabitants of this particular territory see themselves as Kumans. And recently they instituted the Kuman games and you can see photos of that. Old immigrant identity is once more valorized even as the current Hungarian government is pushing a strongly anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies. To conclude, migration was of central significance in medieval life, a conceptualization of life itself, lending it moral and spiritual value. Yet this positive conceptualization did not necessarily have a positive impact on the treatment of actual migrants. They too could be seen as valuable to the life of the realm to the point where rulers actively solicited immigration. Their skills, taxes, and military contribution were all desirable. However, this often triggered competition and grievances among the local populations, which could lead to open hostility and even murder. Thank you for your attention. And I put some further readings if you're interested to follow up on some of these themes. Laura, thank you very much for a, a, wonderful, a wonderful lecture.